وينشر الهدي إيمانا وموعظة فبالجهالة قد خابت مساعينا غابت مناقبنا واسود حاضرنا غابت مناقبنا واسود حاضرنا وأوشك اليأس أن يغشى Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Welcome to another edition of the Suleiman Ravid Show. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Friday night once again. Uh, and uh, when, when it's Friday night, I, I realize it's Friday night because it's the time for the ITV program. And I'm sure those who are regular in watching the program would know that, okay, this is the man that we are seeing on the screens now. So definitely it is Friday night. Back in Johannesburg, it's been a hottish week, hasn't it? especially uh, the early part of the week. Last week, I was in Cape Town for the State of the Nation address. And uh, boy, I tell you, it was hot there too. Uh, they were also going through a bit of a heat, a heat wave of their own. And uh, we were outside uh, in the sun uh, in public. And uh, I, was, I was broadcasting for Radio Islam and ITV as well. Farad Umar, the CEO, uh, was there. And I can, I can still picture him moving around with that uh, small device of his and uh, the sunglasses and, and, and taking visuals and uh, doing crossovers and that kind of thing. But uh, it's been an amazing week, isn't it? An amazing two weeks in South African politics uh, from the time, uh, early part of last week, the constitutional court hearing, and then the State of the Nation address, and we all know what happened there. And then this week, two days of debate uh, in Parliament, uh, the speeches by Maimani, Planet, Zuma, and then uh, Malema really going below the belt and, and, and taking out things from the closet uh, rolling out a few skeletons, what Zuma said to him in confidence and that kind of thing. And uh, then we had uh, Zuma's response. And I, I wonder for how much longer all of this will go on because it's not constructive. In the end of the day, there are rules to parliament, yes. But uh, there, there are certain, uh, you know, there's a certain spirit in which you conduct yourself. And it's not only about the rules. And previously that spirit was held, upheld. So, you know, so usage of certain words, certain kind of behavior, uh, it wasn't accepted, it wasn't tolerated, it was deemed as unparliamentary in, in the past. And uh, the speaker would be firm in that regard. Now, when the speaker tries to be firm, then they, they throw the rule book at her. They say, show us which rule says that this is not allowed. So yeah, technically there may not be a rule, but is it parliamentary? Is it uh, appropriate? Where are we going with all of this? Uh, the ANC... Uh, you know, refusing to acknowledge problems to the extent that it needs to be acknowledged. On the other hand, opposition parties, uh, they are the ones uh, politicking also in many ways because uh, instead of sloganeering all the time and, and reducing all problems to be uh, about one man, Zuma, uh, whatever his weaknesses may be and whatever his deficiencies may be, uh, in the end of the day, if he goes, does it mean all the problems are going to be solved? And the answer is no. But the way the uh, opposition parties are conducting themselves in terms of their reaction to the State of the Nation address, they, they're personalizing it and reducing it all to uh, one man, Zuma. Uh, it's, good, it's a good tactic. It's a good tactic, but it's not a good strategy. It's a good tactic, but it's not good for the country. It's a good tactic because it's an election year and they want to profile him in a particular way and try and tell people, see, a vote for the ANC is a vote for this man, and this man is not good news. How effective that will be remains to be seen, because the strength of the ANC lies in the rural areas, and they see things a bit differently. Uh, many times they would see the kind of tactics that Malema and company resort to as disrespectful of a senior, of, of an elder, of a, of a person who was part of your liberation struggle, what, irrespective of what his other weaknesses may or may not be. Whether you and I would agree with that kind of a mindset, that's not the issue. But in the end, it's, uh, it's about what that mindset is likely to be. But uh, yeah, elections will tell us a good story about how much of damage this has caused or, or, or the lack thereof. Remember, leading into the 2014 general election, many felt the ANC would dip from the uh, mid-60s right down to the mid-50s, early 50s, and that didn't happen. They, they, they lost a little bit of ground, and, and then everyone was taken aback, and you know, people were shocked and were like, oh, okay, uh, you know, how did this happen? There was an Inkandla then too. There were controversies then too, although it's much worse now. And, and yes, everyone agrees, Zuma is as weak now as he ever was politically. Whether he's weak enough for somebody to mount a challenge from within the ANC, personally, I don't think so, not right now. If things develop further, maybe. Is he weak enough um, you know, to, to perhaps think of resigning? I don't think so, not right now. Uh, you know, if things develop further, it, it remains to be seen. Uh, he's still got the NEC stacked in his favor. 
And that's the NEC. It's only the NEC, the National Executive Committee of the ANC, that can decide to, to recall him. No matter what Maimani says or Malema says or Lakota says or anyone else, no matter what they say, it's only one, that's the decision-making body. And even if they don't like him, they're not likely to just recall him because you, you cannot be seen to be a party that puts somebody in power and then recalls him. Uh, within a period of, you know, eight, nine years, you're recalling a second a sitting president. doesn't reflect, doesn't bode well for the president, uh, for the party. So, you know, likelihood, uh, he'll see out the year, he'll probably see out the next. What would be very interesting is that uh, how strong is he as, as the, the debate would start to intensify ahead of the ANC's uh, elective conference at the end of next year and whether he will stand for the third term because they is allowed to stand for the third term, whether he will um, you know, try and choose his successor or what is to transpire at that particular point. But coming back, you know, what's happening in parliament really is not healthy for the country. Uh, the, I know opposition parties will say Zuma must restore his integrity then Parliament's integrity will be restored. But how practical is that? Because if you were to ask that, if you were to follow up that statement of the question and say, okay, tell us then um, what, what should he do to restore his dignity? And they would say the only thing he can do at this stage is resign. Uh, you can agree with that or you can disagree with that, but that's not the point. Uh, even if you agree with it and you say, yes, he should resign, if he was a person of principle, he's not going to. That's quite clear. So where do we go from, uh, you know, th from that point onwards? Uh, you know, how do we react as, as a country? Uh, as players uh, in the political space and, and uh, how much alternatives are the opposition actually offering the country. It's all about Zuma this, Zuma that, Zuma this, Zuma that. I think people by and large know it now. You can remind them from time to time. I'm not saying let him, let him get away with it. But how much are you telling us in terms of the alternatives that you can provide? So definitely not a healthy situation at the moment. Yes, younger people have come to Parliament. It's, it's bound to be a bit more robust. It, it was interesting for a while. But some of these tactics now walking out, it's getting a bit uh, stale. And, and the ANC almost like in zombie-like fashion coming to the defense of Zuma. Something's got to give. Something's got to give at some point. And I hope uh, it will be for the better, inshallah. So enough of politics. And I, uh, I, I just uh, mentioned that because uh, it, it came to my mind as, as I just uh, got started. I was talking about being in Cape Town last week. Cape Town, a phenomenal town, really, isn't it? Uh, they're talking now about uh, moving parliament or having the legislative and administrative capital in one. Many are assuming that Zuma was saying Cape Town, the parliament must move from Cape Town to Pretoria. He didn't technically say that. He said we need to have both in one place. So it could be that uh, the administrative capital moves to, to Cape Town. But I think obviously he meant the other way around because the Western Cape is now ruled by the DA and they wouldn't want to further enhance a province that's not ruled by, by the ruling party. That's just the politics of it. Whether it will happen or how long it will take to happen, I don't know. But uh, I suppose to, Cape Town will still survive. It's, it's a beautiful tourist destination. I had uh, the privilege and honor for the very first time to deliver the Juma talk at uh, the Gatesville Masjid, Al-Quds Masjid, Masjid Al-Quds in, in Gatesville. And phenomenal. What a crowd, mashallah. What a responsive, what an interactive, what an appreciative crowd. It made the uh, Juma uh, you know, pr pr process and, and the entire experience all that more enjoyable. May Allah wa ta'ala bless them and may Allah wa ta'ala accept uh, the efforts of one and all. I read something interesting during the week, you know, it's a statement of uh, Hassan Basri rahmatullah alayhi. He says that a, a wise person, his tongue sits behind his heart. A wise person's tongue sits behind his heart. And an ignorant person's tongue uh, sits in front of his heart. Now, what does this mean? An ignorant person, whatever is in his heart, automatically flows onto his tongue. So the heart is behind the tongue. Uh, that's an ignorant person. Whatever he's thinking, whatever he's feeling, whatever he's suspecting, whatever he's uh, inclining towards, he just has to uh, produce it. He just has to speak. He doesn't think before speaking. He doesn't calculate. He doesn't ascertain. He doesn't weigh up the pros and cons. That is this to be, is this likely to be in my favor if I were to speak? Is this likely to count against me? Is this the appropriate time? Is this the appropriate place? Is this the appropriate person? But a, uh, a, an intelligent person, on the other hand, his heart sits in front of the tongue. The tongue sits behind the heart. So he thinks and he thinks and he thinks and then he speaks. And uh, this, this quote really hit me because all of us are guilty in this regard. Sometimes we just yada yada too much. Sometimes most, most of the most controversial things are said when our guard is down, when we, we're just involved in some banter. That's when we let our own secrets slip out. That's when uh, we, we uh, say things we don't really mean and it offends people. That's when we say things we're not supposed to be saying. 
And not everything is meant to be said. A, a lot of things are meant to be just kept in your chest. Be aware of it, know it, uh, utilize it to, uh, to, to create your own perspective, to be vigilant or whatever the case may be. But not everything is meant to be shared. Not everything is meant to be spoken because the harm that the tongue can cause is, is you know, second to none in terms of uh, not, 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 not equivalent to the harm that the sword or the gun can cause or anything else. The harm of the tongue really, wars have been started because of words and marriages have broken and relationships have been severed and, 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 and hearts have been shattered and the list goes on. So, you know, we need to train ourselves. This is not something that's going to happen uh, overnight. We really, really need to train ourselves. We need to say, okay, how is it that I can, uh, I can control my tongue, discipline my tongue? Every time you say something and, and you're a bit loose about it, then, then you rebuke yourself, punish yourself, make yourself give some charity or read some nafil salah as, as a punishment, as a self-rebuke. Uh, Self-censorship is, 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 is really re, uh, needed when it comes to a uh, person's tongue and the control thereof. So I thought I'd share that quote with you. Also, I read something during the course of the week. It's uh, based on a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When uh, a janaza, a, a funeral was passing by, and the coffin was there, the coffin was there, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at the person and, and made a statement and he said, well, either he is relieved or the people are relieved. Either he is relieved or the people are relieved. And the scholars have unpacked that statement and they say it means that uh, when the Prophet sallallahu said either he is relieved, it means that if he was a pious believer, then he will be relieved to leave behind this, 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 this worldly life with its imperfections, with its trials, with its tribulations and go towards the perfect life, go towards the mercy of his creator. So either he is relieved, if he was pious and obedient, he's relieved and he goes on. Or other people are relieved. If he was an impious person of bad character, of, of bad and evil actions, then people will be relieved that hey, he's gone. We don't have to worry about him and, and, and his, his nastiness anymore. And also evil people, they, they block the full extent of Allah's mercy descending. So we hear many times the scholars telling us about drought and other kind of calamities that afflict people because of the prevalence of disobedient people in that community, in that locality. So when that person goes on, when that person has passed on and that person leaves this temporary abode, this dunya, then the people are relieved of him outwardly in the sense that they say, okay, good riddance, you know. And also, uh, you know, inwardly in the sense that whatever conditions may have been prevalent, that person through his disobedience may have been contributing to those afflictions and calamities coming from the side of Allah. Wa ta'ala. Now there's something here that uh, we should contemplate over. We need to ask ourselves the question that death can come to anybody at any time. We know that. If death comes to me right now, will I be relieved or will others be relieved? When death comes to me right now, if death comes to me right now, will I be relieved or will others be relieved? Will I be happy to go forward and others are sad to see me go? Or will I be terrified going forward and others will be happy to see me go? They say when a, boy, when a baby is born, it comes into this world crying, but everybody else is laughing because they're happy. Baby has been born. And when you die, everyone else must be crying and you must be laughing. You must be happy to move on. You've lived your life in the right way and now you must be happy to meet your creator. So think about it. If death has to come to me right now, what kind of life am I living? Will I be relieved or will those who see me go, will they be relieved? Okay, coming up after the break, uh, as usual, we start with our dua for the day. Then uh, the hadith discussion. Today we talk about the murder of a Muslim and how severe that is in the eyes of Allah. Wa in the tafsir slot, we move on now into the second uh, half of Surah Al-Alaq. And these are the verses where Allah wa ta'ala talks about the rebellious nature of man and specific relation to Abu Jahl. In our Sira discussion today, we talk about the Prophet wasallam's marriage to Khadija radiyallahu anha, his first marriage. And then uh, towards the tail end of the program, our sunnah for the day, and we are still focusing on the sunnats of eating. As usual, I remind you that throughout the program, you would uh, see the email address, the Twitter handle, as well as the Facebook details appear on your screen. Please do interact with us and give us feedback with regards to the discussions that we are having. Welcome back. It's now time for the dua segment, a quick recap of the last time, a dua we discussed. And uh, that was uh, the dua narrated by the uh, great Sahabi Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh. 
and recorded in Tirmidhi. Allahumma simni min ash-shaytan rajim Oh Allah, protect me from the accursed devil. Oh Allah, protect me from the accursed devil. A very simple, straightforward uh, request, but I explained previously that uh, the devil is our great enemy. He's our sworn enemy. He's the enemy from day one. Uh, his animosity was directed towards the first human, our forefather, uh, Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. And he has taken an oath in the name of Allah wa ta'ala not to leave any stone unturned in trying to deviate every one of us. And ultimately, no matter what we do or how we fortify ourselves or how pious we may be or how spiritual we may be, it is only Allah and only Allah that can protect us from the devil. It is only Allah. And that's why every time we read the Quran, we ask Allah to protect us from the devil. But it should not be restricted to that occasion only. Allahumma asimni min ash shaytanir rajim. This dua taught to us by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa makes it known that we should be regularly seeking protection in Allah from the devil. Seeking protection in Allah from the devil. Now the dua that I want to discuss for today, it's narrated by the great Sahabi Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu an. Recorded by Imam Hakim rahimahullah. Allahumma ghfirli khatayaya wa dhunubi kullaha. Allahumma na'ashni wa ahyini wa rzuqni wa ahdini li salih al-a'mali wa al-akhlaq. Innahu la yahdi li salihiha wa la yisrifu sayyiaha illa ant. Oh Allah, forgive all of my sins and mistakes. Oh Allah, elevate me. Give me life and provisions and guide me to pious deeds and morals. Certainly, no one leads to the pious deeds and morals, and no one protects from the evil ones except you. Now, let's unpack it. The, the first sentence of the supplication, Allahumma khfirli khatayaya wa dhunubi kullaha. Oh Allah, forgive all of my sins and mistakes. I have mentioned this in the past, and I will mention it again, that you will see in many of the prophetic supplications, Many of the du'as taught to us by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, forgiveness, seeking forgiveness for sin is a central theme. And that is understood. Kullu bani Adam khatta'un, every son of Adam is a sinner. So every son of Adam, if every son of Adam is a sinner, then uh, it means that we are regularly sinning, even though we're not supposed to be. Wa khayrul at tawabun, but the best of the sinners are those who seek repentance. So therefore, what we need to do is that uh, we need to be regularly seeking repentance from Allah wa ta'ala. And we find this in the prophetic supplications. Oh Allah, forgive all of my sins. There are many. I am humble enough and I should be humble enough to acknowledge that my sins are many. And I cannot even count them. All my sins, all my mistakes, forgive it. Allahumma na'ashni. Oh Allah, elevate me. Remember in the end of the day, in the end of the day, profile, honor only comes from Allah. It only comes from Allah. You can try whatever you want via your wealth, via your context, via your lineage, uh, via your success, whatever the case may be. You can try whatever you want, but true honor only comes from Allah. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us, Man tawada alillahi Allah. The more you humble yourself for the sake of Allah and before Allah, Allah will elevate you. So we say, oh Allah, elevate me. But not only in this world, in the year after as well. Not only materially, but spiritually as well. Wa ahyini. Oh Allah, give me life. You know, grant me true life. Life is a great bounty from Allah. Uh, the longer we live, as long as we're living the right kind of life, uh, the greater the opportunity for us to earn rewards for the year after and to greatly invest in the year after. What is zuqni? Grant me provisions. Oh Allah, I'm asking you for a long life, but simultaneously grant me the provisions so I don't struggle in my life. Wahdini li salih al-amali wal akhlaq. But life on its place and provisions on its place in the end of the day, guide me to pious deeds and good morals. Can guide me to pious deeds and good morals. Innahu la yahdi li salihiha wa la yasrifu sayyiaha illa ant. Certainly, no one leads to the pious deeds and morals, and no one protects from the evil ones except you. Meaning, O oh Allah, only you can grant me this request of mine. We learn something very important from this dua, from this supplication of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that is that whilst you ask for life and you ask for provisions, don't forget the internal. Don't forget your your internal condition. Ask for good deeds, ask for good morals, because that's what make it the man. In reality, your, your value and uh, your profile in, in the eyes of Allah is not as per your wealth status or as per your uh, social status or anything of that sort. No, it's as per your spiritual status. 
it's as per the quality, not even necessarily the quantity, the quality of your actions. Allah says, I created you not to see who does the most, but to see who does the best of deeds. The best of deeds. So here we're asking Allah, grant me good morals, grant me good character, grant me uh, good deeds. Let my deeds be good, let my character be good. There is none that can grant this to me but you, Allah. So like we desire spouses and children and a house and a car and, and, and wealth and, and, and material comforts and there's nothing wrong with desiring any of that as long as it's halal and permissible. Why don't we desire good morals, good character, good values, a good spiritual standing in front of Allah wa ta'ala. And this dua teaches us that we should not only desire that but we should supplicate to Allah for that. So the dua once again, narrated by the great Sahabi Abu Ayyub Ansari radiyallahu an, and recorded in the Mustadrak of Imam Hakim. Allahumma khfirli khatayaya wa dhunubi kullaha. Allahumma na'ashni wa ahyini wa rzuqni. Wahdini li salihi la amali wa akhlaq. Innahu la yahdi li salihiha wa la yisrifu sayyiaha illa ant. Ameen. Ya Rabbal Alameen. Waswadda haadiruna wa awshaka al-yasu an yagsha. Welcome back. It's time now for the hadith slot. A quick recap of the three ahadith that we discussed last week. It had to do with joking with people and taking people's things jokingly or, you know, in jest. Whether you do it in jest or whether you, you know, do it seriously, either way, you're not supposed to be taking other people's things. You're not supposed to be inconveniencing them. It may sound like something so mundane, so simple, but that's the beauty of this deen. Islam is not a religion, we say it all the time. Islam is a way of life. Islam is not a religion, Islam is a way of life. So what we need to understand is that our deen is comprehensive. It touches on every aspect that is necessary for it to touch on in order for, for us to be, to be sufficiently and adequately guided when it comes to living our lives. So the first hadith we discussed last week, Abi Humaid al-Sa'idi radiyallahu an mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu said, لا يحل لمرئن أن يأخذ عصا أخيه بغير طيب نفس من It is not permissible for you to take your brother's stick, just his stick without his consent. These days we think, I'm just, just borrowing his pen, I'm just uh, using his shoes. Uh, you know, you come to the masjid, and now you need to go to the bathroom and maybe he's got sandals and you got shoes. Thinking I'm going to put my shoes in and out and tie the laces, just take his thing and go. But you don't have his permission. You don't have his permission. When he comes and he doesn't see sandals there, he, he'll panic. He'll start thinking, oh, you know what, maybe somebody took it. Maybe it's stolen. Uh, and then even though it may be a few minutes only before you re return and he'll realize that no, uh, it, it, didn't, it wasn't stolen, then too, you've inconvenienced him for that time. We discussed the other hadith uh, from Abu Dawood. لا يأخذن أحدكم متاع أخيه لاعبا ولا جادا that uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly none of you should take the belongings of his brother neither in amusement nor seriously whatever he sees no matter how trivial it may be it may be his pen, it may be his cell phone it may be whatever you know something small, something trivial I gave the example last week also of children in school this is where they develop this bad habit take his highlighters, take his, uh, uh, his, um, his pencil take his sharpener, whatever the case may be it's wrong, it's not yours, and you are inconveniencing somebody else. And then we discussed the hadith of how Sahaba were on a journey with the Prophet ﷺ, and uh, one Sahabi went to sleep and he had his rope with him, and they took the, the rope away. And I explained last week that a rope was an essential item when you were on journey, and when he woke up, he was startled. And Nabi ﷺ said, it is not lawful for you to frighten a Muslim. So you know, sometimes we get this where they hide people's shoes. Uh, we see children doing it, but we need to teach them. You hide people's shoes, you hide someone's thing and you think, oh, it's a big joke, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's done in jest. No, these things are impermissible, these things are inappropriate. Now, today we move on and today we talk about spilling the blood of a believer. Spilling the blood of a believer, murder of a Muslim. Many of us may think, well, I'm not a murderer. I may be capable of many, many things. Some of them so bad that I won't even want to even divulge it and I wouldn't want anyone to know. But murder, eh, that's like the highest level. Of, of evil. Uh, we may think that we are not capable of murder. We may not be people who, who just go out with the intention of committing murder. But in the end of the day, sometimes you put yourself in a particular position and you may, you may end up being a perpetrator in this regard. You put yourself in a particular position and you may end up being a perpetrator in this regard. So the first hadith, 
عن بريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قتل المؤمن أعظم عند الله من زوال الدنيا قتل المؤمن أعظم عند الله من زوال الدنيا that the murder of a believer is worse in the sight of Allah than the destruction of the entire world like the destruction if the world had to come to an end it would have been a great calamity for mankind it's a great tragedy in the court of Allah for you to just kill one believer unjustifiably just one unjustifiably it's a greater crime in the court of Allah Taala. sometimes when your anger gets the better of you you're fighting over a parking space there's an argument in the family these things have happened brother-in-laws brothers friends they argue the egos get the better of them draw the gun and then what have you done apart from the fact that you've widowed some women or and you've orphaned some children in the eyes of Allah, it's a greater tragedy. It's a greater tragedy than this world coming to an end. The next hadith an Abi Sa'id al Khudri wa Abi Hurairah radiyallahu anhuma yadhkurani an Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal law anna ahl al samai wa ahl al ardi ishtaraku fi dami mu'min la kabbahum Allahu fi nar rawahu tirmidhi. If everyone in the heavens and everyone in the earth were to get together and share in the murder of a Muslim, Allah will throw all of them in the fire of Jannah. Allah will fl- uh, fling all of them, throw them headlong into the fire of Jannah. Meaning it's such a severe crime, such a severe crime, that Allah will not hesitate punishing all the inhabitants of the earth and this world put together if they were all simultaneously guilty of that crime. That's how serious it is in the eyes of Allah. Wa ta'ala. Don't put yourself in a position where you can become the perpetrator of this uh, crime. And then there are those Muslims, gangsters, proud of it. I'll take you out, I'll take you out, I'll take this one out, and I'll do this and I'll do that. These things are very serious in the eyes of Allah, even if you get away with it in this material and in this temporary world. The next hadith that I want to discuss is a hadith uh, narrated by Abu Dawood. And, uh, uh, or rather it's a hadith, yes, Abu Dawood. And Abi Dardai radiyallahu anhu qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, كل ذنب عسى الله أن يغفره إلا من مات مشركا أو مؤمن قتل مؤمنا متعمدا أبو دردة رضي الله عنه says I heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم say it is hope that Allah will forgive every sin there is hope there is hope for the forgiveness of every sinner except two people that person who died whilst he was a polytheist a mushrik a person who did not worship Allah alone he worshipped idols or your associated partners with Allah. And the second, a believer who intentionally killed another believer. A believer who intentionally killed another believer. Although the scholar is right that this intentional killing of a believer doesn't fall in the same category as kufr and shirk. Kufr and shirk, if you die in that state, there is eternal punishment. But as the Quran says, that when it comes to killing the believer intentionally, there is a very lengthy, very severe punishment, almost as if it's eternal. That's why the Quran says, فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمُ خَالِدًا فِيهَا The person who kills a believer intentionally, his, his punishment is an eternal suffering and, and chastisement in Jahannam. وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ And the anger of Allah is upon him. وَلَعَنَهُ When Allah curses him. وَعَدَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا And for him Allah has prepared a very severe punishment. Then the next narration also from Abu Dawood. And Ubada ibn Samit رضي الله عنه عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال مَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا فَاغْتَبَطَ بِقَتْلِهِ لَمْ يَقْبَلِ اللَّهُ مِنْهُ صَرْفًا وَلَا عَدْلًا Ubadah bin Samit radiyallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he who kills a believer, he who kills a believer and rejoices at it, Allah will not accept any of his actions, be they obligatory, obligatory or optional. So you know, this, this, these youngsters sometimes, they grow up with that attitude, macho, you know, I'm the man, I'm the man. And you know, they think nothing. Of, of, of taking somebody else's life and they're proud about it and they pump their chest and they puff their chest and they're willing to tell everyone, I took him out, I sorted him out, I put my guys on him. Uh, Allah, it's such a crime in the eyes of Allah wa ta'ala, that Allah wa ta'ala is not willing to accept any of your good deeds as a punishment for this wrong that you have done. And the last hadith I want to discuss from Muslim, an Abi Bakrata radiyallahu anhu qal, Sami'atu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, Ida tawajah al-Muslimani bi sayfihima falqatilu wal-maqtulu fi nar Qal, faqultu, awqil ya Rasulullah, 
هذا القاتل فما بال المقتول قال إنه قد أراد قتل قتل صاحبه. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had said when two Muslims draw their swords on each other or in today's times they draw their guns on each other then the killer and the victim are both in the hellfire. So the Sahaba queried and they said Ya Rasulullah we can understand why the killer will be punished but why the one who is the victim? So the Prophet of Allah said because they both had the intention of killing each other. The one who died it's only because the other one shot first. But when he drew his gun, he was also ready to kill the person. So these were two believers and they both drawing guns on each other. The one was fast, the one was quicker and uh, he, he was able to shoot or perhaps he was more accurate. And the other one died. Both are in the hellfire. The one because he, did, he intended and he carried it out. The other because he intended. Had he had the opportunity, he would have killed the other person. He would have killed the opposite party. So these are very serious statements that come from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we make dua to Allah wa ta'ala, that He keeps our lives protected and that He also grants us the understanding with regards to the value of the lives of others and that it should never be that we are directly or indirectly responsible for the loss of lives uh, when it comes to especially believers or any human or any creation of Allah wa ta'ala. May Allah wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. <laughs> Welcome back. It's time now for the tafsir of Surah Al-Alaq. And previously we discussed verse number 5, where Allah wa ta'ala says, عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ He taught man what man did not know. And we explained previously that uh, the first five verses were the uh, verses that were revealed in, at the time of the first revelation in the cave of Hiram. So in the previous verse, verse as we had discussed in, in, in the weeks gone by, Allah wa ta'ala spoke about the importance of writing and then Allah says, Allah taught man what he did not know. And uh, man came into this world knowing absolutely nothing. Allah taught him either via the pen or either via teachers or even directly where, you know, how, how is it that the baby knows to latch onto the breast of the mother? How is it that the baby knows that it must cry to get attention, to get food? All of these things have been taught by none other than Allah wa ta'ala. So it's an indication Allah is saying, O oh Muhammad, peace be upon you, that if Allah taught and teaches every child that comes into existence, why won't Allah teach you even though you are unlettered? Why won't Allah help you and assist you and guide you in the fulfilling of this mission of yours? Actually, Allah will help you and guide you and assist you to the point that you will be the most intelligent person and, and the greatest of all humans in terms of being blessed with knowledge and wisdom and insight and foresight and recognition of Allah. Wa we also explain that Allah wa ta'ala could have sufficed by saying, Allah al-insan. Allah taught man. Because to teach means when somebody doesn't know, you teach them. But Allah for added emphasis brought the words ma lam ya'lam, that which man did not know. To indicate to us today, remain humble, do not become haughty, do not become arrogant. Because you knew nothing, you knew absolutely nothing. And Allah is the one who taught you everything that you know. There isn't, there isn't even the extent of, of, of one atom that you know except that Allah taught it to you. Either directly or via a means, but even that means was by the command and by the permission and by the decree of Allah wa ta'ala. Now, moving further, the next two verses, verse 6 and 7, Allah wa ta'ala says, Kalla, no such thing. Inna al insana la yatgha, man transgresses. Arra'ahu staghna, in that he considers himself to be self sufficient. Now, the first five verses until Allam al insana ma lam ya'lam, as I explained, were revealed in the cave of Hiram. The second part of the Surah Alaq was revealed much later. I had mentioned this uh, in the past. So these two verses, Allah wa ta'ala says, Kalla, no such thing. Inna al-insana la yatgha. Man transgresses. How? Arra'ahu staghna. In that he considers himself to be self-sufficient. Now the scholars have written that this is in reference to the arch enemy of the Prophet wasallam, the pharaoh of this nation and ummah, Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl, we all know, was a person who was the leader of the Quraysh. He had great wealth, he had profile, he had status, he had everything going for him. Actually, they used to call him the father of wisdom before they called him the father of ignorance. The reason he got the title Abu Jal is because he knew the Prophet ﷺ was the true prophet, but because of jealousy, tribal jealousy, that why must the final prophet come from that branch of the Quraysh and not this branch of the Quraysh, 
he became one of the greatest obstacles in the in the path of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he lost his life in a very disgraceful way uh, on uh, on the occasion of badr actually his pride and arrogance was such that the two youngsters muad and muhawwid had fatally wounded him and when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent abdullah bin mas'ud the alan that go and see that is he really dead and abdullah bin mas'ud the alan found him in the in the final throes of death and uh, because abdullah bin mas'ud the alan in makkah used to be a shepherd and after he embraced islam allah honored him and he became very knowledgeable and he became the personal assistant to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so abu jahl looked at him and said you know very condescendingly oh shepherd you came to kill me all right if you're going to kill me then cut my neck closer to the chest so when my my decapitated head when it stands alongside all the other heads that have been decapitated it stands a bit taller so people can say that's the leader of the quraysh abu jahl that's what pride and arrogance does to a person now why does pride and arrogance come there is an indication here you see the more allah blesses you with bounties health wealth profile strength you start to think that you are independent you start to think that you are self sufficient remember allah is samad allah is the only being that's totally independent we can we can try to be independent as far as possible from other creation but the only being that's totally independent from anything or anyone else is allah we as servants no matter what health or wealth or strength or intelligence or acumen or capacity or ability or capability or knowledge or or fame or profile or whatever that we have in the end we are still dependent on allah tabarak wa taala so it, this is this is this is something which is uh, found many times in humans uh, almost all of us suffer from this even believers the more we have the more allah grants us the more we start distancing ourselves from allah my knowledge my wealth my children my wife my house my company my intelligence my effort my hard work my strategy my thinking but in the end allah tabarak wa taala says that causes rebelliousness and abu jahl became very rebellious we know there are different different examples of how he tried to uh, to harm the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the incident that the scholars of tafsir have penned which read, led to the revelation of these verses is that one day he had taken an oath in the name of his idols art and luzza uh, uh, lat and uzza that he would go and, and place his foot on the neck of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in sajda and uh, one day he came into the haram and he saw the prophet of allah making salah near the kaaba and he decided today is the day i'm going to do, go and you know with pomp and glory and show and defiance and arrogance uh, he's moving now and his people are clapping him on and they're cheering him on and they're saying go you go for it abu jahl but as he comes close to the prophet of allah he backs off and he tries again and he backs off and he tries again and he backs off people tell him what's happening he said but didn't you see they said no what did we see nothing he said no there was a big trench of fire that appeared and a very nasty frightening wicked looking creature with hands all over the show that was threatening me and that's why i pulled back and then after a while i thought okay let me try again and the same thing appeared and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said had abu jahl still went ahead and tried to do it the angels would have come and they would have chopped him pieces to pieces they would have totally shredded him uh, that was that was the punishment that was awaiting him but then he got a shock and and, and he went back but it was on this occasion that allah tabarak wa taala revealed the verse or the verses kalla inna al insana la yatgha ar ra'ahu istaghna no such thing man transgresses from this that he considers himself to be self sufficient the verses that were revealed are not only these two they come they continue and we will discuss uh, some of the other verses in the coming weeks inshallah the lesson for us to learn nonetheless is that the more allah blesses you the more you must be grateful and the more you must be humble that did not be that the more allah blesses you the more you become arrogant and you start to think yourself of as independent may allah tbaraka wa taala grant us that realization the understanding and protect us amin ya rabbal alamin اسود حاضرنا واوشك الياس ان يغشى
Well, it's almost time for us to wrap up uh, this evening's program and uh, we look, uh, well, firstly, let me thank you for tuning in, for watching, for being part of the program, you know, although uh, you're not part of it in a direct way, but you're part of it in an indirect way because you're sitting and you're watching. And I say this every week because I want the viewers out there to feel part of uh, the process. The weekend is a, is a great opportunity to catch up with the family. Remember, we all need that balance in our lives. It can't be all work and no family time. Uh, you know, you need to spend time, quality time with the family, not time where you're at home physically, but you're more on the phone or you're more sleeping than anything else. Utilize the weekend. To keep yourself busy. Keep yourself within the parameters of the Sharia. Do constructive things, but do different things. You know, things that you couldn't do much of in the week. Do more of it now in the weekend. Rest a little bit more, but also dedicate a little bit more time for ibadah. Why not? I'm not saying all of your time must be for ibadah, but you can wake up a little earlier. You can you know, dedicate a little bit more time to recitation of the Qur'an and that kind of thing. Get down, play with the children. You know, they say if you want to be happy, spend that five minutes extra with somebody that you truly love. If you want to be happy, spend that five minutes extra with somebody that you truly love. On that note, from myself, Sunayim and Ravit and all of us here, Fi amanillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. فاستنه ضيهب من فالمسجد الأقصى ما زال يدعونا نديع على الفتية الأحرار في زمن أضحى به الحق بالخذلان مدفونا فبالجهاد بنى الإسلام قوته وهل لغير قوي الناس يصغونا رباه هيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا فأنت من بالتقى والدين يهدينا ادعوك يا أمتي فاستنهضي همما فالمسجد الأقصى ما زال يدعونا ندي على الفكرة الأحرار